Okay, test one, two, test one, two, testing. Test one, two. Testing. It takes like forever. Talking normally. I'm not getting anything. Oh. Yeah, it took a long time. Yeah, that actually, that sounds pretty good. Okay. Cool, cool. All right, so you guys are good to go? No testing. Oh, I think the audio's. I don't know where the audio's coming from. It's not this. That's okay. Oh, do you think it's. It could be. It's something else here. I don't know. Honestly, as long as it sounds okay, I don't really care. Yeah, exactly. Well, I know. Because I don't see here anything else other than us. I mean, it's just like rainy, but like that's just because it's. Uh, Anyway, um, if everything seems good, I'm going to go back to the other room, and you need Josh in here? Or assistance for, I don't know. I, I don't know if it would be a good idea in case something goes south of the stream or OBS. I kind of understand OBS, but I don't have that much. Yeah. All right, I'll get him over here. You can just yell at me if you need help. I'll be back there. Okay.
I think it's about 115 here. So we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and get started here. So first off, though, I I want to start and see uh, what what teams do we have represented in the room here. So uh, start over there. What what team number are you guys? 840G. 40G. 4 C. Six five two three. All right. Four R. All right. Cool. So we got we got we got a lot of different teams in here. All right. All right, so uh, we'll, start, we'll start off with uh, who I am. So my name is Charles Jeffries. Uh, I've been doing Vex Robotics for about nine years now. Um, I did five years in VRC. So I started off in eighth grade uh, on 2114B. And uh, from there, I, I went all the way through my senior year of high school. Uh, and my last year in high school was a Turning Point, if any of you were competing then. Uh, and then the last, the last three years, I've been in VexU, and then this is my fourth year uh, on Team Pyro. Uh, last year, we went to the World Championship. There's a picture of us there. Um, and I also have been volunteering in Arizona for uh, VRC tournaments for quite a while now. Um, last year, I uh, head refed the uh, middle school and high school state championships. Picture me there if I was the one with the blue flag hat. There's a story behind that if you... Uh, want to ask me that afterwards. Um, I'm a senior at, in software engineering major uh, at ASU, actually here on the Polytechnic campus. Uh, and over the last couple summers, I've worked at companies like Optum and Garmin as a software engineering intern. So I've had a little bit of industry experience from that. All right, so today's presentation is called Intro to Sensors and Control. We're going to go over the different types of sensors that VEX has. Um, that are available to you, and we're also going to look, look at what, you, what applications you can use those for, as well as some more advanced control logic that you can use to process the data that you get from these sensors. All right, so first, let's break up the sensors that VEX has into a, couple, into a few different categories here. So first is sensors that measure rotation, and we'll find sensors like the potentiometers, the encoders, and the rotation sensor in there. Um, there are sensors that measure contact uh, and are kind of an on-off. That's like the limit switch and the bumper sensor. We'll also have uh, sensors that measure the distance to an object. So we'll have the V5 vision uh, distance sensor in there. We'll have the uh, ultrasonic sensor. We'll also have some kind of visual slash optical sensors that can determine various visual properties about an object. So for instance, we have a vision sensor, which obviously can detect color or patterns even. There's the optical sensor, which can detect color uh, as well as uh, presence of an object. And we also have the line tracking sensor, which can be used to kind of gauge how bright something is, such as a white piece of tape versus a gray tile. There's also inertial sensors, which kind of help us judge our orientation uh, in three-dimensional space. Uh, so we'll have the V5 IMU as well as some older uh, inertial sensors. All right, so let's start off with some of the rotation sensors here. So uh, the first rotation sensor we'll look at are the potentiometers. There's actually two different types of potentiometers of excels. There's an older red potentiometer, which is a V1 potentiometer that we see on the top here. Um, and potentiometers measure absolute position, which means that you can power your robot on and off as much as you want. As long as you haven't moved the sensor, it should read about the same. They're often used to um, detect where an arm is in its uh, rotation. So if you want to see if your arm is all the way up or all the way down, or measure where exactly it is in between there so that you can control its position precisely. That's a good application of it. Um, though the interesting thing is that because this uses the three wire ports on the brain, it's actually an analog sensor. So if you swap them out, it might not be for, for a spare. You know, say you break it or might be, or you get a new one. It might not be exactly one to one the value. So you got to kind of be careful and maybe recalibrate uh, your code every time you swap it out. Now, so again, like I said, there's, there's two types. There's a V1 and V2. The V1 has a smaller range of motion. And if you move it beyond that range of motion, it can actually break and damage the sensor such that 
it will either no longer function anymore or become or will start functioning erratically. So you got to be really careful with those. Make sure you never ever rotate them beyond their little stops. And if you stick an axle in there and just spin it by hand, you'll feel that uh, with at the ends of the 250 degree range, uh, there's these little stops that you hit, and you don't want to go beyond that. It's really easy to do if, if it's a if it's a if it's a powered mechanism. So you need to be very careful with that. Now there is a V2 potentiometer that VEX sells. It has a much wider range of measurement. Um, so the old V1 was 250 degrees. This one's 333 degrees. And it has the benefit of being able to rotate continuously without breaking. So it doesn't have the stops. Um, but there is, there is a small area uh, about 47 degrees, or sorry, uh, 27 degrees, where it won't be able to measure. However, it won't break if you turn it through there. So if you're choosing between these two, I'd recommend V2 uh, just because I've seen so many red uh, old V1s bro broken. I've probably broken four, five, six myself <laughs> uh, over, the, over the course of my career in high school. And yeah, so V2 is probably the better one, but V1 definitely still works. Another sensor that we have to uh, measure rotation are encoders. And we have, a, we have a few different types of these encoders. We have the encoders that are built into the motors themselves. Um, so every motor, uh, smart motor that we have, has an encoder before it goes into that colored gear cartridge, which means that if we're using the high torque gear cartridge, red gear cartridge, we'll actually see that the motor has a 0.3 degree accuracy, um, which is very nice. However, if we swap that out for a blue gear cartridge, which is faster, uh, then we'll see that the accuracy decreases to 1.2 degrees. And that's because the encoder disk in the picture here is actually before it goes into the gear cartridge here. Now, the other encoder that we have is an external encoder called a red quadrature encoder. And that has an accuracy of one degree, and it plugs into the ADI with two uh, three-wire ports. These are commonly used in drives, arms, and flywheels, mainly when you, need a, when you need a sensor that can continuously rotate and can measure rotation throughout the entire 360 degrees. So uh, drivetrains where you know, your wheels are constantly spinning are better. If you have it on a lift, it might not be as, as good as something like potentiometer because, again, we're only getting like one degree per uh, accuracy, whereas a potentiometer will give you potentially much higher accuracy. But again, continuously rotating, rotating mechanisms, this can be much more ideal. Now, there is a third type of sensor that VEX sells for measuring rotation. It is called the rotation sensor. It is kind of a hybrid between a, um, an encoder and a potentiometer. Um, it has a very similar um, accuracy to a potentiometer, so it actually can measure all the way down to 0.88 degrees. Um, and so it has that very high resolution. And if you power it off and power it back on again, it will know where in its rotation it is. So just like a potentiometer would. So it, it, it's, it's called an absolute position mag magnetometer. It uses some weird physics that are kind of complicated, but overall it does have that, that uh, ability to continuously spin so it can measure rotations as well as the absolute position. So overall, this is probably the best uh, rotation sensor that VEX offers. The only downside to it is that it costs more than the other options. So uh, a quadrature encoder or a potentiometer is going to cost a lot less, but there's going to be some drawbacks. It's also a little bit bigger than maybe one of those uh, other options. Um, but if you have the choice, I would try and fit one of these in. All right, so let's take a look at a potential application that we can use for these encoders. Say you have your drivetrain, you're trying to drive straight across the field. This will be a big thing in skills this year where you want to make sure that your robot doesn't curve, drive over the line in autonomous, or is just going where you want it to. Um, there, this can be caused by a lot of different things where, say, there's more friction in the left side of your drivetrain, so it will go, move slightly slower and you'll drift to the left. Um, it can cause by, say, you have a little bit, the gears are maybe a little bit looser on your right-hand side of your drivetrain, so then there's a, it'll the left side will start moving before the right side. Um, we can compensate the, with this using um, some encoders mounted to the wheels themselves. So that way, we're not just measuring um, the rotations of the motors, which could have some play in there. But say we, we mount encoders to the wheels themselves. That way, we can measure the amount that the wheels have rotated. And if we know the circumference of the wheels, we can know how far each side of the drive has traveled. 
Um, so in this scenario, we would want to try and use some closed group control, which we'll get to later, um, in order to make sure that both sides of the drive have traveled the same amount of distance. If one side of the drive travels a little bit further, then that will uh, cause us to drift the other direction. All right. Oh, and there's another little addendum to this. I did say that we can put uh, encoders on our wheels. However, there's a, there's a little bit of a tip here where your, the, motor, the wheels that are powered by your motors, when they're trying to transfer that power, that energy, through, through the wheel and gripping the ground, if you turn on your motor suddenly or even are just trying to accelerate your robot a lot, the wheel can start to slip against the ground. And if we're measuring the rotation of the wheel and the wheel slips against the ground, then suddenly that, that rotation that we've measured is no longer representative of the distance that the, that the robot has traveled. So in that scenario, we're going to introduce some error and inconsistency in our autonomous, which we don't want. So what we can do is, instead of having our encoders on our powered motorized wheels, we can make a separate set of wheels um, that are not powered by motors, not connected to the powertrain at all, and instead are merely turned by, the, by dragging across the ground and having the ground turn them. And then we can measure that rotation and measure the distance that the robot has traveled much more accurately. Uh, bonus points if you mount these wheels on a rubber banded kind of hinge. So in this scenario here, it's a little hard to see. You can kind of see it up there a little more. But that screw is a hinge. And if we rubber band that uh, encoder pod into the ground, even if our robot runs over a bump, runs over a screw, you know, gets lifted up a little bit for, for whatever reason, maybe tips back a little bit, that wheel will never leave the ground. So it will always be a truthful representation of how far that side of the robot has traveled. All right, so moving on to the context uh, sensors. Uh, so these are pretty simple sensors. Um, we have the limit switch and the bumper switch. The uh, limit switch is generally the better option of the two because it has this metal clip here that um, by, this is legal in the rules, it's specifically mentioned, that you are allowed to bend and uh, maneuver just to get exactly that right actuation point. Um, and it also has a larger range of motion. So there's, there's a little bit more freedom in there. Uh, the downside is that when, uh, is that occasionally, because this is so long, if you, if a game object gets stuck on the side or you try and pull it backwards, it can rip off the sensor and break the sensor. So with the, bump, with the limit switches, you gotta be really careful with them, but if you treat them well, they can be a really good asset. Uh, and again, if, if you, they're basically just kind of an on-off sensor. If you press it, then uh, the software will read uh, a true pressed. If it's not pressed, then it will read a false. There's no real in-between measurement, just kind of on or off. Bumper switch is, another, is the other sensor. It's not recommended for most applications because its, act its area that you have to press it is very specific, and it's not adjustable like the limit switches. So in that scenario, we don't really recommend bumper switches. However, the bumper switch is a little bit more robust than the limit switch because it doesn't have that bending piece of metal. So in the scenario, let's say you have a lift that comes down and you want to detect when the lift is all the way down and you're kind of, it's, it's hitting the sensor a little bit more, then the bumper switch might actually be an ideal option for that. Uh, but for most scenarios, I think the limit switch is probably the better option here. So one use that we can use, that we can have for these sensors is detecting game objects in our intake. This year, it's really important that we don't import, that we don't intake more game objects than we're allowed to. So we're only allowed to hold three disks in our robot. If we hold more than three disks in our robot, we're at risk of being disqualified or otherwise penalized. So wouldn't it be great if we could have some software on our robot that would prevent us from intaking more than three disks? Well, how do we know when we've intaked a disk? One way of doing that is by having a limit switch that reaches down into the intake and every time a disk goes through, it'll push that limit switch up, and we can count that actuation in the software. Uh, we can also use that to say you have a flywheel, and you don't want—you might want to just be able to hold down a button and intake a disk, but not necessarily shoot it. Then you can have it intake it until it's right about to go into the flywheel, until it presses a limit switch, and then automatically stop the intake before it gets shot into the flywheel. So. There's a lot of different uses for this. Um, 
over the years uh, in Turning Point and in Nothing But Net, I've used a lot of limit switches uh, to detect balls in the intake. That way I could just hold down one button when I'm driving around in the field to intake uh, game objects, and that way I could focus on intaking them rather than making sure I didn't accidentally shoot them. All right, so the next two sensors we're looking at here are the ultrasonic sensor and the distance sensor. Um, the ultrasonic sensor is a little bit older. Uh, it, it's been around for a long time, and it does, it, the way it works is that it will send out a pulse of sound, and then because we know the speed of sound through air, it will wait until that, that pulse of sound is reflected back at it, and it will measure the time it took for that to come back. And then using that, it can measure uh, the distance to an object. Uh, however, the, the issue becomes when you have multiple of these sensors in play, uh, say your opponent has some of these, you have some of these, uh, the issue is that they can start to interfere with each other and give you erroneous values, um, which can be problematic and difficult to deal with. Uh, so in that way, we're, they're not recommended. The other issue is that when you have multiple of them on your robot at the same time, the more you add, the slower each uh, individual ultrasonic sensor will send out pulses. So you'll get data less often the more you add. Now, on the other hand, we have the new V5 distance sensor. Instead of using sound, it actually uses a laser, and it can measure the time that the, it takes for the light emitted from the sensor to go out, be reflected, and be received again. Uh, so in that way, it's much more advanced. It also has a much smaller beam. So the sound on the ultrasonic sensor, as you would expect, kind of spreads out, and it's, it can kind of reflect off of different objects, and it might be unclear what exactly you're measuring to. Whereas a distance sensor, it has a much tighter cone for the, the laser, and uh, it has a much higher precision in general. Um, so I believe it can go upwards of 200 millimeters, uh, which is a decent amount. Or sorry, 2,000 millimeters. And um, yeah. Now the only issue though is because it's using light instead of sound, if, you're, if the object that you're trying to measure is transparent, then that could be an issue. So if it's clear plastic, for instance, now, the field parameter is clear plastic. So this is something you want to be careful about. I've talked to a lot of people who've used uh, the distance sensor with uh, the field perimeter, and what they recommend is that if you're going to use it to measure the distance to the field perimeter, then you want to try and make sure it's aimed at the field perimeter as head-on as possible. That way you get that reflection that goes right back to the sensor, and it can still sense it. If you kind of aim the sensor at the field perimeter, uh, the plastic on the field perimeter, say 30 or 45 degree angle, it might not measure uh, the field perimeter. It might instead go through it and measure the thing that's behind the field perimeter and give you a value that you don't want. Alternatively, you could, you could place the sensor either higher or lower, so that way you hit the metal of the field perimeter rather than the plastic. All right, we kind of mentioned this, but in autonomous, uh, one thing that we might want to do is we want to know where our robot is. Because uh, say maybe we've hit another robot, maybe we've kind of drifted as we've gone through our programming skills run, and we want to know the distance to that wall in front of us. And because if we know that distance to that wall, we can uh, kind of help figure out where we are in the field. So in this scenario, you can mount the distance sensor to the front of your robot uh, with a known position on it and then you can aim and uh, measure the distance to that wall relatively accurately and then reset your position uh, based off of that. So say, say you want to get a certain, say six inches away from the wall, instead of just doing your previous driving command such that you think you'll end up six inches away from the wall, why don't you measure it and make sure that every single time you drive up to that wall, it's gonna be six inches away. This can be also useful for say the loader, the disc loader, uh, during programming skills runs, if we want to make sure that we're a specific distance away from there uh, when you're introducing those. All right, so now on to the kind of more optical sensors. Uh, we have the line tracker, uh, which detects surface reflectivity. And it might not be immediately obvious, but the way that the line tracker actually works is that there's a small infrared LED Infrared light is not visible, but is visible to the sensor that the uh, line tracker uses. There's an infrared LED inside the sensor that shines out, and then the, the infrared light that's reflected comes back into the sensor. 
this works uh, in kind of synthetic light environments, like a classroom here or an LED light uh, room. However, if you have incandescent lights or sunlight that's hitting the sensor or the, or the field, um, both of those contain a lot of infrared light and they can kind of mess with the sensor. So if you're outdoors or if there's sunlight shining on the field, uh, that can cause these to kind of have issues. That being said, uh, I know for, for a lot of years, and I think I may have used it in Turning Point, I used it in Nothing But Net, uh, as a way to detect a ball uh, in an intake uh, without touching it, uh, which was, uh, there was a reason for that, but they can definitely be useful for that. It's also, you know, as the name implies, there are white field tape, there are white tape lines in the field. You can use the sensor to detect where those lines are and either follow them or use them to reset your autonomous position uh, very precisely. And it will detect the change in brightness between the gray, uh, uh, the gray field tiles, which don't reflect that much LED uh, light, and the white tape, which will reflect a lot more of the infrared light. Uh, now, the more modern V5 alternative to this is what's called the optical sensor. Uh, the optical sensor uh, is a color sensor, so it can detect the color of game objects. This year, our game objects are only yellow, uh, so there's not really, like they're neutral game objects, not really a huge utility to detect the color of those. However, one application that might be really good for this is say you had a, you wanted to detect the, the position of the rollers. Now, those might not be a given. Your opponent might have moved them. Um, you might have something else to do. So if you want to measure the color that is currently facing out on the uh, roller, you can use the optical sensor. Great for that. Uh, it also has some proximity detection, so it can kind of tell if something is close or far to it. There's not a lot of granularity there. I think if, if I remember correctly, the function is literally is close. <laughs> um, but if you just want to know, is there, is there like a ball in front of me or a disc in front of me, that could be useful for that. The, now there is a downside to it is that it can be slow to react. Um, I've heard that the update rate on it, and this could depend on several factors, uh, could be upwards of a, of a tenth of a second, which might not sound like that much, but it, if you're spinning that roller very, very quickly, you might start changing colors very quickly, and a tenth of a second could be a quarter or half a rotation of that roller, depending on how fast you're spinning it. So that's just something to consider, uh, that there might be some latency you have to account for there. All right, so another application of this, and I kind of mentioned this with the line tracker, was that, well, what if we want to detect the game objects in our intake, but we don't want to touch them? So say our, our intake is, is open, and if we have something like a limit switch that's kind of spring-loaded that's touching the disk, it might push them out of alignment or out of where we want to go. Or say we just don't want something that touches, and you know we don't want a, a mechanical sensor that can fail or break. Well, we can use the optical sensor or the line sensor in a flat position where when, when the disc passes over it, it will occlude that sensor, and we can detect either the increase in reflectivity from the line tracker, that's because this yellow is very reflective surface, or, the, or a darkness on the optical sensor, um, or even a color reading there. So that gives you a little bit more flexibility with um, the, without touching, to be able to sense the game objects without touching them. Uh, which can be useful for a lot of different things. Now, one other thing we might want to think about here is that we could also maybe use a distance sensor. Say we have uh, our intake, which is this wide, and then we have a disc that goes through it. If we measure the distance of the width of the intake without a disc, it could be, say, six inches. But with a disc, it could be half an inch because it goes over the top of the sensor. So that's another way that we could potentially measure a disc without touching it. All right. Okay, so... Uh, another kind of uh, optical sensor, but it's a little, it's in a, kind of in a league of its own here. Uh, the vision sensor um, is an interesting sensor that VEX sells. Uh, it requires a lot more effort uh, to put into use than the other sensors of VEX sells. It is not as plug and play. However, it offers some capabilities that are completely unique amongst VEX sensors, and there's not, it's not really replaceable for. Um, the way it works is that it actually has a small camera uh, that, uh, that's a proper camera that looks at, out, out the front and it has an onboard processor that uh, can detect pre-programmed either colors or color combinations. So in the picture here, there's like a, a blue cat or a yellow ball 
or a blue flag with a blue part and a green part. Uh, if it can detect all of those individual signatures and tell you where in its field of view that is. So uh, in this picture here, uh, we have a turret, a robot from nothing but, or sorry, from a turning point, uh, which was a shooting game with a turret on it. And the way that it would work is that it would find the flags of the opposite color and would uh, uh, aim at those flags and shoot the balls automatically. This way, even if the robot's being pushed, if, even if it's being turned, um, it can still aim automatically at those flags without driver intervention. This year, we also have a shooting game. So a very similar concept could be employed with the goals and the discs. If the robot can know where at all times the goals are on the field and can aim at them, instead of meticulously aiming with your sticks on your, on your controller, you could simply press a button and the robot would turn and face the goal and automatically shoot. That could be useful for when you're being pushed. Uh, it can also just be faster than human aiming. Now, the downside is that it is very subject to lighting conditions. So if the uh, color of the lights on the field is different than what you calibrated with, if the brightness is different, if there's flashing lights, that can all cause interference. and can cause it not necessarily to detect the, uh, the uh, signatures that you're looking for. It can also be uh, have interference with colors in the background. So this year especially, we have the goal. If you, look, if you think about your, where your robot's going to be on the field, it's going to be close to, the, close to the ground. You look up in the air, you see the goal, and then behind that is a net. But the net is semi-transparent. So if there's, uh, say, anything that's behind that net that could have colors or even just movement could potentially interfere with the vision sensor's ability to detect that colored goal. So that's just something to, to, be, to uh, think about. But again, though, if you can make it work, if you can make your software robust enough to deal with any errors, if you can get your sensor calibrated on the field, it could be the only sensor that allows you to look and actually see where the goal is and aim at it. Another way that, you, that it might also be useful in autonomous is that if you want to see, goal, see uh, disks that were shot by your opponents, and you didn't know where they were going to be ahead of time, you can use it to kind of search out and find those disks in Autonomous. All right, so moving on to more of the inertial sensors here uh, that give you your uh, rotation in three axes. We have two old sensors here. Now, I'm not sure, these have been discontinued for a little bit, but I know there's still a lot of them floating around. So uh, if you haven't seen these, that's okay. They're a little bit, a little bit older sensors. Uh, the top one is a what's called a yaw rate gyro. It is a gyroscopic sensor that will tell you the angle that it has rotated since it was powered on in one axis. That means that in, in only one direction of rotation. So say you mount it flat on your robot, it can measure whether your robot's turned left or right. It won't measure whether the robot tips forward or backward or side to side, though. Uh, now the issue with it uh, was that it was, uh, it drifts a lot, so if, even if your robot was standing still, uh, it would kind of slowly act like it was turning to the left, say, five degrees. Um, and it also didn't have the highest of revolutions, the resolution. So that, with that being said, it's not really recommended for mo modern use, but I wanted to still explain what it is when we get to the, because it'll be helpful to understand when we get to the inertia sensor. Now, there's a similar story with the three-axis accelerometer. The three-axis accelerometer is a little bit different. Um, instead of measuring rotation, it actually measures movement. So it can measure the acceleration or the change in your speed forward and backward, side to side, and up and down. This can be useful if you want to detect when you run into something. Say in your autonomous, uh, you're, going, you're one of the teams that goes and gets the discs on the autonomous line. But you're sure that your opponent might also get that disc. If you can detect a sharp change from an acceleration, say you, your robot hit your opponent's robot on that autonomous line, then you can know that you, that you were hit and maybe don't do something as risky uh, later on in autonomous that might, because your robot might be thrown off course. But again, though, it's, it doesn't have low resolution and it, it's, it's not, it has a lot of noise in it. All right. Now for the more modern alternative to these. This is the V5 inertial sensor. It is basically the combination of the yaw gyro and the three axis accelerometer except it's better in every way. Uh, it, it, it has a three-axis gyro in it, which means that it can measure rotation side to side, yes, but also back and forth, it can measure rotation 
as well as side to side. Uh, roll it, roll rotation. Uh, rotation. Uh, yaw is obviously meant, mentioned most for turning, but, uh, and I did this personally last year, uh, when you're climbing, so for instance last year, when you're climbing the platform, uh, it's very easy to get tipped over. Uh, what if your robot could detect when it started tipping over and automatically drive in the direction that it was tipping to prevent itself from tipping? So you can do that with the V5 inertial sensor. If you detect that your roll or pitch is getting too high, you can move the robot quickly in that direction to stop it and prevent from tipping over. All right. Um, one thing, uh, oh yeah, and, so, and then it also includes the same three-axis accelerometer uh, that, the, that we saw before, except it's higher resolution, has less noise. However, it still has enough error, and this you'll find in industry, in the real world, with most accelerometers, um, they're not going to be super useful for actually detecting your actual position. Uh, it's still going to be mainly useful for detecting if you've hit something unexpected. Uh, one thing that uh, is an important idea with uh, the inertial sensor is that you might want to mount it on top of something flexible that can import, uh, that can absorb shocks, like the uh, a rubber link here. If you've seen this, Vex sells this. It's basically a little bit of a screw and a screw, and in the middle is a bit of rubber. So uh, if you get hit by a robot and your robot suddenly jerks, that um, very fast change in angle can be hard for the inertial sensor to keep up with, and it can cause it to drift. So if you have something that can kind of absorb that shock a little bit, it can uh, help with drift uh, on the uh, neural sensor. Oh, and there's another special note here. This is a little bit of a weird thing, and it's not super intuitive, but it is incredibly important to understand if you're going to use an inertial sensor. And that is mounting orientation. When you change the mounting orientation of the uh, inertial sensor, so you go from flat to, side, to sideways, um, the axis that measures yaw, so say you have to, you have to measure the z-axis for uh, measuring uh, yaw angle when, you're, when, the, when it's mounted uh, uh, right side up here, and then you turn it on its side, the z-axis is actually still going to be the uh, axis that you measure for yaw. And the reason for that is that the, when the inertial sensor is powered up, it will measure the force of gravity from the Earth and will determine which way is up and which way is down. And from that, it will determine which way uh, the z-axis or yaw axis is. So in any of these six ways that you can mount the, uh, mount the inertial sensor square, then it will, uh, you'll see that z is always met pointing down towards gravity. So that's just an important thing to know. Uh, and if you want to see this, this picture again, we'll have the slides uh, online uh, afterwards, I believe. But also, VEX has a knowledge base article that uh, describes why this is in more detail. And I'd recommend anyone using an inertial sensor to look at that article. All right, so here's a uh, application for something like the inertial sensor. What if we want to improve uh, the accuracy of our turns, but we don't have room to put in those idle encoder wheels that aren't powered by motors? A lot of people are trying to make really compact robots with really compact drive bases, and you might not fi be able to find a space to put those encoders. 18 inches isn't a lot of space uh, in, you know, after all. We can use an inertial sensor to kind of get halfway there. Uh, if we use the inertial sensor, uh, we can measure the rotation that the robot has, has done. And if we mount it in, uh, according to best practices on a rubber link, et cetera, then as the robot drives around, and even maybe its wheels are slipping because we're turning real quick, or maybe we're being pushed or whatever, then uh, we're going to still have that ground truth of which direction we're facing. Uh, and so if we don't have the encoder, we can see that maybe the wheels, the robot's wheels slipped a little bit in this corner, this corner and maybe it slipped a little bit more you can see that over time, so as the further that, that robot drives, even a little bit of angle difference or slip, wheel slip, is going to make a huge difference. But if we knew that we needed to make sure that we get to that angle, no matter how much the wheels have turned, and the inertial sensor tells us that we're turning at that, we're, we're facing that angle, then we can uh, cancel out that drift. However, over time, and we're talking in, this, in the case here, 
generally longer than 15 seconds. Um, so this will be more relevant for like a programming skills run. There is still some drift in the uh, IMU. I've seen it go up to somewhere in the neighborhood of three degrees over a minute or so. Uh, that might not sound like a lot, but when you're driving all the way across the field, it can mean four inches of difference, which can be a big deal. So you might still want to try and find ways to, you know, uh, line up against the line or against the wall or something like that and reset your head, your angle heading. All right. So uh, that's kind of the sensor side of things. Uh, let's look at some control algorithms. So we have a bunch of data now that we've gotten from these sensors. We've gotten rotation data. We've gotten, like, if a, if a uh, bumper switch is pressed. Uh, we got inertial data. Uh, we got color data. All kinds of stuff like that. How do we use that? So there are two kind of ways to control your motors on your robot. There's either open loop, what's called open loop control, or closed loop control. Open loop control is basically motor spin. I don't care how far you actually spin, I'm going to tell you to try and spin this far, or maybe at this, at this speed, but I'm not going to check that. That can work for basic movements. However, maybe our batteries are a little bit uh, lower than when we practiced. Maybe there's a little bit more friction on our drive base because maybe it got bent a little bit in the last match. Maybe we added another mechanism so there's some extra weight on the robot so it doesn't accelerate as fast. So then it doesn't go as far. What if we, we want to, you know, so if, if we're not accounting for that, if we're not, if we're using open loop control where we're just sending a command input, a control signal to the motor, and then the motor's spinning, we're not getting any feedback from there, we're not going to be able to account for any of those differences. So, Enter closed loop control. Closed loop control uh, changes the signal, the command signal to the motor based off of feedback that we get from measuring the motor's output. And that feedback can be gotten well, oftentimes from encoders, sometimes from potentiometers, something like that. Rotation sensors are, are pretty often, often used in this scenario. Um, say the uh, motor is spinning a little bit slower than expected. Well, we can increase the motor power to compensate. Say, you know, say there's a little bit of extra friction, we can increase motor power and it will overcome that extra friction and spin at the same rate as when before we had that friction. Maybe the motor didn't spin quite as far as we wanted it to go. Uh, so say we're driving, our robot's driving forward and we wanted to drive up and grab a disc. But maybe the wheels spun, maybe the, the robot was overloaded, maybe the wheels, the drive base is starting to overheat. Maybe our battery's dead and it kind of went a little bit slower and didn't quite make it. Well, we can detect that with the feedback and then can tell the motors to spin, oh, just a little bit further in order to make sure that we get to our target. This overall is a little bit more complicated. However, it has the benefit of being much more consistent across a wide variety of situations here. So one algorithm that is uh, used in closed loop control is called PID. PID stands for Proportional Integral Derivative. And in VRC, uh, often you'll see uh, maybe only the P part, so that's proportional part used, or maybe only the P and the D proportional derivative parts used, uh, and that's especially on the drivetrains. The way that PID works is thus far, it says this. In the real world, say you're driving a car, and say you're going about 40 miles an hour and you see a red light up, to, uh, up ahead of you. You know that you need to stop right on that white line at the red light. So if you're telling your robot to drive forward until it gets to a certain distance and then stop the motors, it's the same thing as driving 40 miles an hour to that, to that stoplight and then the moment your wheels touch the, the white line, slamming on the brakes. Now, you're going to come to a stop, however, you're not going to, A, you're going to miss where you wanted to come to a stop. You're gonna, you're gonna skid to the stop somewhere in the middle of the intersection here. And B, the amount that you're skidding might change depending on say, what if the road is wet? What if there's a little bit of an oil slick? So you're going to introduce some inconsistency in that. So see, this is the ideal world. You can go at full speed right into where you wanna stop and then stop instantly. That doesn't happen. In the real world, you try and stop and it takes you some time to stop here. So proportional is kind of a much more realistic way of controlling a robot. You give it the amount of power uh, relative to how far you have to go to the target. 
So say you're driving towards the stoplight. Um, the closer you get to the stoplight, you're going to start easing off on the gas. You're going to start slowing down the car in preparation to stop the stoplight. And that's, and that's in, the, in that scenario, we're uh, calling the distance between what we, where we currently are and where we want to be the error. And that's a good term to remember. All right. However, uh, P ends up uh, either, if you, if you give it uh, too little influence over the equation, it'll kind of take a really long time. So like if you think about it this way, if you're driving the car and you let off the gas and that's all you do to slow down, it's going to take you a long time to slow down. And you might go past uh, where you want it to stop or you might have to stop let, start laying off on the gas really far back and it's still going to take you a really long time to get to that stoplight. So the alternative here is what's called derivative. So derivative will slow down our motor power based on uh, relative to how, based on how fast the motor is moving. So think about this. If we're getting, if we're getting close to the, the stoplight and we're letting off on the gas, yeah, but we're also, uh, you're getting too close to the stoplight, but we're still going pretty quick, we're going to start hitting the brake. And that's going to start slowing us down uh, above and beyond what just letting off the gas will do. So uh, in that scenario, it prevents us from flying past the line at the stoplight. Uh, in this scenario, the middle line there is what we'll, we'll see with derivative, where it will kind of start slowing down. It'll have the same speed as, as proportional uh, up until right when it gets, starts getting close to the, the target, at which point it'll start slowing down more to make sure it doesn't overshoot this line. Uh, and, you know, with the example of a car, this is, you'll expect this is very um, uh, applicable to drivetrains in autonomous. When your robot's trying to drive straight a certain distance, you want to make sure you don't overshoot, you don't oscillate, you don't go, go too far and then have to come back and then have to go back, you know, go too far again. That just wastes time. You, you have a very limited amount of time in, in 15 seconds. All right. And now that third uh, part of PID, integral. Integral is a little bit less used in VRC. Uh, however, it still has its uses. When the error is small, so say we're, we're, we're close, we're, say we're about five feet away from the line in, at, the stop, at the stoplight. We're so close to the stoplight that we don't really have enough, uh, there's not enough error that uh, will push down the gas hard enough to move. Um, but we still want to get that last five feet. So when the error is small, we can kind of, uh, depending on the amount of error, we can add that error to a running total and we'll slowly increase the amount of power that we're giving to the gas pedal until we start to move and close that last five feet. And then once we get to that last five feet, we can hit the brakes and stop again. Uh, and because of that, it can take a little bit to kick in, so it can take a, a split second, um, which is a little bit more delay than a lot of time you'll, you'll want in your uh, drivetrains uh, in autonomous in VRC. Um, and, you know, however, in a uh, longer, pro uh, uh, longer programming skills routine, uh, that is something that might be a little bit more useful uh, because you might want that extra precision trade-off for, uh, uh, because you have extra time to use. All right, so now I do have a video here. Um, oh, should. Oh, there it is. Uh, there is a video here that kind of demonstrates these concepts and we can kind of see them in action. I really like this one. Oh, this is just proportional control, and the motor's trying to get the arrow to that center point there. We can see that it controls the amount of power that the motor is using to get to there is proportional to the distance it has to move to get to the center. Now we increase the amount of power the proportional has. We'll see that it gets a little bit closer. However, you'll see that it overshoots. Now we're, now we're enabling a little bit of derivative. Now we're slowing down as we get closer to the middle. So we get there really quick, but we're stopping pretty close to the middle here. Now 
However, there is still that little last bit to get to the middle. So now we're going to enable, oh, so now this is still KP, uh, but this is the, there is no uh, derivative in this measurement here. You can see it takes a little bit of a second for that I term to kick in and move it to the center after the piece turns up. And now this is demonstrating one of the tricky parts with uh, the I term where uh, it can kind of cause you to start overshooting again if you uh, don't add a special, what's called anti-windup term, where basically if it's, you only want to use I when you're really close to the, the center. So uh, I can see if I can play that last little bit again here. Because that's really important. It, imagine you're, uh, oh. So in autonomous, this is what you want your drive train to do. You want it to get to your set point very quickly and then stop right on the dot. This is what a, this is what a properly tuned PID loop can do. All right. Okay, so um, that was PID. That's just one closed loop control uh, algorithm. There are a few other options. Um, Especially this year, uh, where a lot of you might be trying to use a flywheel to shoot the discs um, versus, you know, versus other options like a catapult or something like that. Um, there can be some uh, more optimized solutions for those. So uh, one scenario, one uh, solution is called take back half controller, which is kind of a modified PID controller, but it's designed specifically for systems with a lot of inertia, like flywheels, um, to prevent them from oscillating, uh, which can be a big issue with them. Uh, and then PID itself, and, you know, in, in its variations like take back half, uh, can, is, is kind of just the base level of what uh, control, uh, closed loop control is. There's a whole world, there are people who get graduate degrees, master's degrees, uh, PhDs in control theory. Uh, there is a whole world of that. So if that's something that you're interested in, there's a lot to learn there. Uh, it's really cool stuff. Um, but so the neat thing is that if you know how to do PID controllers, then that gives you a lot of flexibility to go on and uh, learn more, um, more advanced algorithms. So for instance, back to that uh, example that we use for wanting our drivetrain to drive straight uh, autonomously, we can use three PID loops. We can have one PID loop for the left side of the robot to make sure that it's traveling the right amount of distance. We can use one PID loop for the, uh, the other side of the robot to make sure it's traveling the right amount of distance. Um, and then we can have one PID loop that's kind of sitting in the middle to say, okay, well, I know I'm supposed to be facing this direction. And if we start facing to the right, then that's gonna introduce some error and it's gonna use the, the output of the PID controller to kind of subtract power from one side of the drive and add it to the other so that the robot turns back towards center. So that way, if the robot's maybe running over something, if it's having more friction or whatever on one side, we can account for that and always make sure that the robot is facing the right direction that we're looking, uh, that we want to be, and is driving the right distance. There's also much more advanced uh, algorithms like Peer Pursuit, which is really complicated. I'm not, I'm not gonna get into it today, but uh, if you wanna Google that, uh, Peer Pursuit allows a robot uh, allows you to have a path, like say a curve or some kind of loop or whatever it is that the robot can sit there and follow by following a point on that path as it goes through the curve. So a, a lot of you, and I know that for me, it was in high school I mainly did this, you can have your robot drive straight, turn, drive straight, turn. Well, wouldn't it be maybe faster if your robot could just drive in a curve and take a shorter path? Pure Pursuit can allow, algorithms like Pure Pursuit can allow you to do that. And uh, right about at the end here, there's a, there's a couple um, resources uh, I'd recommend here. And these, these are links, so you'll have them in the uh, slide deck when we send those out. Um, there is a guy named George Gillard. He made a PDF document uh, explaining PID control um, in the context of Vex Robotics competition. It is the document that I learned PID control back when I was a freshman in high school. Uh, it is an excellent document. I used it as inspiration for explaining PID in these slides. Um, 
this is a link, so when, when you get that slide deck, definitely go take a read uh, of, that, uh, of that PDF. Um, it's just really nice, and it explains things in really simple terms. And, and it also gives you some tips for kind of tuning uh, those, those different knobs that you can turn uh, for uh, changing the amount of influence of the PEIND aspects the algorithm has. Uh, and then I also have linked a uh, FRC forum post talking about uh, uh, peer pursuit. And FRC is the big uh, high school robots. Uh, they, have a, they have a lot of, uh, if you want to look more into control theory, uh, search for FRC, the name of the control algorithm that you're looking at, and there will be lots of uh, results that come up with lots of cool things. So, all right. Uh, I think that's about done here. Um, well, I got, I think, another 10 minutes or so. Anyone have any questions? Um, I, yeah, uh, I don't know. So, so for microswitches, right? If I'm using microswitches, you can bend those microswitches. You can't attach anything to them, right? As far as... So limit switches here? Yeah. Um, so you can, you're not allowed, you're allowed to, ta you can attach anything you want to them uh, within the legal bounds of the VEX robotics like, system. So you can't glue something to it, but say you had like a, a, le a legal zip tie and you wanted to zip tie something to it, you can absolutely do that. And I've, we've actually done that. Uh, so like, say we, we wanted to extend this a little bit further, we took a little bit of a, of a aluminum kind of half cut C channel and just zip tied it onto the end and okay. provide like a bigger surface to, to uh, touch. So uh, the I and P A D, if you if you wish to not use it in a code, but you still wanted to like have it as like, uh, so like you wanted to have it in your code, but you didn't want to use it for a specific part of the program, so you didn't have to like code two completely different P A D S if you're using them interchangeably. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to set the I to like zero or something, and would it just have the same effect as not having it in there at all? Yeah, so the, the question was, um, I'm going to repeat the question here. I'm not sure if the microphone heard it. But um, the question was, if you have multiple different things that you're using PID for, and you want to use I for some of them and not for others, can you disable I for that those things you want? Uh, the answer is yes, depending on how you program it. So you can have a PID loop that when you run it, every time you run it, you pass the values you want it to use, whether you know PI, the values for P, I, and D uh, you want to use. And then in that scenario, you can have I set to zero, which will effectively disable it, remove it from that equation uh, for that uh, use case. Uh, and I've personally done that, so I didn't want to write, so back and say, in the zone, the game with the cones, I had a PID for my lift, I had a PID for my drivetrain. I didn't want to write it five times because I had like a bunch of them. So what I did was I had one PID loop and then when I ran that PID loop, I would kind of take the output of it and control whatever motor it was I wanted to control. But when I uh, ran that PID loop, I would put in the set of values P, I, and D I wanted it to use. Now, there is a little bit of trickiness when you start using things like D and I because those values kind of depend on what the values, the previous run of the loop were, uh, the previous round of feedback. So you'll also need to store those values when you uh, pass them to the PID loop. But yeah, that's definitely something that you can do. And that, and that does go for any of the, of the uh, parts of PID. If you want to disable them entirely, so say, say for some reason you just want I and D. I don't know why you want to do that, but say you want that. You can set the p value and the and the, you can set the p value to zero, and then that way only i and d will be present in the in the uh, equation. Um, how what are the limits? So how many how many of these can you put on? How many sensors is the V five limited to? So that's a good question. So the question was, um, how many sensors uh, is the, is the V five limited to? And that depends on the sensor. So if we have something like say the inertial sensor here. That uses one of the smart ports on the brain. Uh, you're limited by the number of ports. So that uses a smart port, which is the same port that the motors all plug into. Um, and as many of you, as you have working ports of those, you can plug those in. Um, so, but you know, but other ports might be taken up by motors, your radio, maybe other sensors, stuff like that. Um, 
personally, I've never run out of smart ports. There's like, there's 21 of them on the brain. You have eight motors, so you'd have to use, and, and one radio. So you'd have to use somewhere in the neighborhood of what, 12 sensors or something like that? 12 smart sensors? Which generally pretty unlikely that you're going to run out of those, especially in high school. And then if I were to, which I doubt it, but if I were to, um, would I have memory issues? You're, the, the V5 is a generally a, a very powerful, it, it's running somewhere in the neighborhood of like 600 megahertz. Okay. Um, it is, if you, wanna, if you want a tangible comp, uh, a comparison, it is about as fast, it's using a similar processor to the iPhone 4S. Okay. Um, so it can actually process quite a bit um, user code, as long as you're writing your user code relatively sanely. It's not like the Cortex, you could pretty quickly run into some of its limits. Uh, but the, the V5. Now, when you're talking about the limits of, of running out of, of sensor ports, what you're much more likely to run out of are uh, the three-wire ports. So, for instance, like things like the uh, limit switch, the ultrasonic sensor, quadrature encoders especially, um, because each of those quadrature encoders takes up two ports on the thing. And you only have eight ports. So that means you can only have four quadrature encoders or maybe three quadrature encoders and two limit switches. And then you're out. There is a, I should have maybe put it up here, but there is a product that Vex sells called the ADI expander, because the ADI is what they call the three, what, those, those three wire ports on the side of the brain. You can buy one of those modules that will use up a smart port and then will provide you with eight more of the three wire ports. So in that scenario, you could you know, hook up another four uh, encoders, which if you're using that many th old three wire uh, sensors, that can, that can totally be uh, a great use for it. And three-wire sensors are still totally valid. Uh, you know, there's, there's some smart port alternatives, but not always, and the smart port alternatives are often way more expensive. And you might have the three-wire sen sensors. That's totally fine. Even in my VexU team, we still use a bunch of three-wire sensors because they work, and they're simple, and they're cheap. Yeah. You have questions? No. Any more questions? I think, I think that's it then. Thank you. So there is, um, there's a couple more presentations coming up. There is a presentation on competition, kind of like tips for competition. Uh, if you, so if you've never been to a competition or if you just want a refresher, tips on what you should do to have a better experience. That's in the other auditorium. Uh, if you want to stay here, uh, we're going to do kind of an introduction into text programming. Um, so for those of you who haven't done that, you can stay here. Um, but and that will start at about uh, 2.30, I believe. So, yeah.
directed, so I can just pull well, it. Well, you have any phone calls. Yeah, it's just a little bit over here. Just wear like a neck brace, like you were in a car. Yeah, I got beat up in an alley. Thank God. All right, I think we're about 2.45 here. So I think we're going to start, get, we're about to get started here. So, all right. So this is uh, intro programming. Uh, we're going to look over kind of uh, some introductory uh, text programming basics as well as some useful tools uh, called Git and uh, a few other things. Now, before I begin, this is going to be a little bit more, if you attended the previous presentation, this is going to be a little bit less of a presentation and more of like a kind of uh, interactive uh, classroom kind of thing. So if you guys don't understand something that I'm talking about in the slides, feel free to raise your hand, interrupt me, and I'll answer your question. Uh, programming is a lot more interactive than it is, and it's taught a lot more, a, a lot better interactively than it is, you know, just presentation. So. All right, so we got a few new people here, so I'm going to go through the, uh, who am I? So my name is Charles Jeffries. Uh, I have been doing Vex Robotics stuff for about nine years now. Uh, and when I was in high school and middle school, I did five years of Vex Robotics competition on Team 2014V. Uh, I started in eighth grade, and I continued on all the way through senior year in high school. And now that I'm at college here at ASU on the Polytechnic campus, I've been doing uh, VexU on Team Pyro, uh, and now that I'm a senior in college, this, this is my fourth year uh, on Pyro. So, as you can see, uh, last year we went to the World Championship uh, for uh, VexU. We got the Build Award for our division, actually, so we're very proud of that. Uh, and then I also have been doing uh, volunteering in Arizona for a while now. It's been, I think this is the fifth year. Last year, I... Uh, I was the head ref for the middle school and high school state championships, so I was the head ref with the blue flag hat, if you remember me. Uh, I am a senior, like I said, I'm a senior, but my major is software engineering uh, here at ASU. And over the last couple summers, uh, I've done some internships, and I've worked at uh, companies like Optum and Garmin, so I've gotten a little bit of industry experience from those. First, before I really get into the presentation, I, I do want to make a note here. Um, making mistakes and fixing those mistakes is something that's going to happen in programming. It's 90% of what programming is. So if you make a mistake when you're programming something, or you know, even if it's just like forgetting to put a semicolon or forgetting to put a dot, don't feel bad. It happens to me constantly. It is something that just happens in programming, and it's normal. So don't worry about it. Uh, we're going to do some kind of a little bit more interactive programming stuff. I might make a syntax mistake. It might take me a little bit to fix it. But we'll work through it together. Uh, that's just something that happens. Uh, the, the essence, the idea of programming is it's not about remembering where all the dots go and all the parentheses. It's about understanding the problem, understanding the tools you have to solve that problem, and then using them to solve that problem. So if you have to use Google to remember where to put that parenthesis, that's totally fine. That's normal. I do that constantly. If you look at my work computer, I probably have, and this is not, not a joke, I'll probably have 200 tabs of Google. Just trying to remember various things. But then through that, I'm able to achieve what it is that I want to do. And programming is something that you learn by doing. It is not something that you can kind of learn just by being taught to. Uh, it's something that you kind of have to work with on your own. Uh, so take what you learn from this and the resources that you learn over in this presentation and uh, work with them on your own time. Uh, and that being said, uh, so like I said, this is going to be a little bit more interactive. So uh, because it's be a little bit more interactive, I wanted to get a little bit of data on the audience here. So who here has programmed anything at all before? OK. So who has programmed a VEX robot before? We have a few that way. Okay. And who is programmed a Vex robot using text programming, so not blocks? Okay. Uh, what about with C? Okay, so mainly okay, mainly Python then. Okay. Cool. That that so we got we got a, a pretty wide spread here. That's neat. Okay. Alright, so part one. 
So this is gonna, we're going to start with kind of the more basic basics of text programming. So for those of you who haven't programmed before, those of you who uh, have used uh, more blocks, uh, this will be mainly directed towards you. But in part two, we'll talk more about some of the tools like Git and stuff like that. But. All right, so this is a review. Code, uh, either both blocks and text, is a list of instructions that the computer is going to execute in the order that they're written. So it will execute instruction number one, then wait until that's done executing, then move on to instruction number two, wait until that's done executing, wait and move on to instruction number three. And through those lists of, of instructions, we can instruct the B5 brain to move motors, retrieve sensor data, uh, and display, display things on the screen, and a whole lot of other things. So for this presentation, we're going to be looking at a text programming language called Python. It is available in uh, VexCode v5 on the desktop. There is a Visual Studio Code extension for VexCode that supports Python, if you know what Visual Studio Code is. Um, and also, you've used, you might have used Robot Mesh Studio. It's kind of a little bit on its way out now, unfortunately, but Robot Mesh Studio also has a Python interface. And there's also a uh, web browser, uh, VexCode Python, that we'll be taking a look at uh, that's useful, so you don't have to install any software. <clears throat> All right, so let's do kind of one of the more basic things that you want to do uh, when you start programming Vex robots. Move a motor. Uh, so in Python, uh, we, there's a very specific syntax, which is the way that we're going to format our command to the computer. Uh, so say we have a motor that's called motor1. Uh, and let's say we want to make it spin at 100 RPM. This is the command that we're going to use to make it spin at 100 RPM. Um, so we can see here that there's a motor one. That's that's what we saw. We see that the function or that we're calling or command is uh, called spin. We're saying that we're, we want to we want to spin forward, and we're saying that we want to spin at 100 something, and we're saying that something is RPM. So there's a few different units that you can use. RPM as one of them. So uh, in this, you know, same here. Uh, motor one is the motor spin forward. Um, and an RPM is rotations per minute. So one thing that it is worth noting is that spin is, it's not technically called a command. What it's actually called is a function, which is basically something that that motor can do. It can spin, it can do a few other things, like we can get sensor data and such, but we're specifically saying, I want this motor to spin. And then the uh, things that are separated by commas and are inside the parentheses for the function spin, uh, in this case forward 100 RPM, are what's called parameters. They're the information that we're giving to spin to, to kind of describe how we want it to spin. All right, so it's worth noting that this syntax that we saw on this slide here, um, where the formatting of where we have this dot here, we have this parentheses, we have these commas, are is a very specific um, syntax that must be followed in order for the computer to understand what we're asking. So for instance, here's a bunch of uh, options that won't work. The computer will just say, I don't know what you're trying to say for this. So here, here we say we missed a dot. So we're saying motor one. Okay, the computer's like, I know what motor one is. But then we're missing the dot. So now the, the spin here, the rest of this is now disconnected from the motor. And now the computer has no idea what we're talking about because it doesn't know that we're talking about the spin part of motor because we're, we've missed the dot that's connecting them. Uh, here, we are using square brackets instead of parentheses. Uh, the computer's going to be unhappy about that because square brackets are used for other things other than parameter lists. Uh, so it's, it's not going to be happy about that. It's going to be looking for these parentheses. Uh, here, we're missing a comma. So where it was expecting to have a direction, a value, and then a unit, we're going to give it a direction and a unit value which it's not going to be able to understand what this is, and it's going to be looking for that third parameter, which it's not going to find. So the computer's not going to like that. Um, this one looks fine, except we see that we've capitalized the M. And this is an important thing. In programming, when you have the name of a variable or the name of an object, um, the, when you reference that, when you use that object or that variable, the capitalization matters. So in this case, 
the, mo the computer's going to say, I have this, this capital M motor one, I've never heard of this. Even though we have a, a lowercase m motor one, it's not going to recognize it. It's going to treat it as something completely different. So you got to make sure you, you get your cases correct. And this one here, we're missing parentheses entirely, and the computer is going to be like, I don't know what, what you're saying. There's no parentheses here. I have no idea what this is. Uh, and we, before we go a little bit more, I want to talk about something that's actually not a command, and it's a special thing in Python called a comment. So in, in Python and in programming in general, a lot of the time we want to kind of leave notes for ourselves, leave notes for ourselves, for people that come after us um, to kind of explain what our code is doing. Because if you just have a bunch of motor spins, well, yes, okay, the motors are spinning, but why is the motor spinning? How, like, what's, it, what's the robot trying to do? And that's, that's not immediately obvious if you're just looking at the code. So what we do is we will write a pound symbol here, or hashtag symbol, uh, and then anything that comes after that on the same line as that pound, as that hashtag symbol, uh, will not be will be ignored by the computer. So this will be a valid line. So it'll have the motor spin command here, and then it will ignore all this text here. But the text will still be there for us humans to read. So I would highly recommend, especially for newer programmers, comment every line of your code. That way. A, it, it forces you to explain to yourself exactly what each line of code is doing, which can make it way easier when you're not understanding why the robot is, is do, not doing what you want it to do or is doing something you don't want it to do. And for the person who comes next, uh, who comes next to look at your code, it's extremely helpful and helps them understand what your code is doing uh, without having to reverse engineer it. So I'm going to be using some comments in the code uh, throughout the rest of this here. Uh, any questions so far? I got one. Sure. Uh, under the function commands, is there a way to list out those? Uh, what is option? Or what options like spin? Uh, what's another one of the function codes? You know, is there like a list of what those? Yes, are? there is. So in uh, so, the, so oh, I'm going to repeat this for the mic here. The question was: Is there a way to find a list of the functions that you can get uh, with a motor? Um, and the answer is yes. In VEX code, uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, there is a list of actually all the functions that you can use built in for motors, for the brain, for sensors, stuff like that. Um, all those functions that are available to you will be listed in the left-hand side, and there's even like a little question mark that you can click on that will kind of explain how you can use those functions. And uh, later on in the presentation, we're going to actually go to VEX code and look at that, and it, I'll try to remember to show you that, but if I don't, Speak up and, oh, and remind me. Yeah. You. All right, so uh, let's move on to another concept in Python, and that's variables. We have motors, yes, but what if we want to kind of store our own numbers or our own values? So in Python, uh, variables are actually really simple. It's actually probably the, one of the defining characteristics of the language is that it's really easy to make a variable. And really, all you have to do is type a, um, oh, there's a, there's, a, there's a mistake here. There, there's supposed to be a uh, underscore here, actually. <laughs> uh, so I said I would make some mistakes. Here we go. Here's one. Uh, so there's supposed to be an underscore here. Otherwise, the computer would not uh, like this. Uh, it's just like this one here. Uh, you type in a variable name uh, with no spaces in it, and you put equals, and then you put whatever it is you want it to be equal to. So it could be a number. In this case, this is like a float. You could also do an integer number. Um, you can even do strings, which are wrapped around by quotes. So. In this scenario, we're taking the number 352.4 and we're putting it into this vari into my variable. And then we're and we're also taking the string hello, which is a list. A string is is a list of text, and we're putting that in the my variable too. And then again, we have a comment here just to explain that hey, we're storing some text in this variable. We can also do math of variables. So see in this scenario, oh, it looks like I think it got cut off. That's what it is. Um, these are all supposed to have uh, underscores underneath them here. Uh, variable 1 uh, is being set to 3. Variable 2 is being set to 6. We can then use those variables in place of numbers in equations. So in this scenario here, we can add variable 1 to, uh, to 1, the value 1, and then subtract the value of variable 2. So in this scenario here, with variable 1 equals 3 and variable 2 equals 6, what would variable three be set to? That's a question for anyone out here. Four minus two, negative two. 
Yes, that would be correct. So it would be, so we follow the order of operations here and even then, you know, it's, it's plus and minus, so it doesn't technically matter. But yeah, so we're gonna, in this, in this uh, equation here, variable one is gonna be replaced with its value, which is three. Uh, variable two is gonna be replaced with its value, with this, which is six. And then we're gonna end up with three plus one, which is four, minus six, negative two. So the value of variable three is going to be negative two mm. in that scenario. Mm. Everyone good with that? All right, so uh, another thing about variables is that we can also use them not only in just standalone equations, we can use them as a parameter because we, they, they represent a value and that value will be sent to whatever we uh, give the, as a parameter. So looking back at our motor spin uh, example here, uh, if we set a variable called 93, uh, sorry, we set a variable called speed to the value 93, uh, and that's just the number, we have a nice little comment to explain that. Then uh, we call spin, and instead of having, say, 100, which is what we had before, we give it speed, uh, which we have previously set to 93, to the spin function. The question is now, how fast will the motor spin? 93 RPM? 93 RPM, that's correct. Because when, we, uh, when the spin uh, function is called, uh, we'll pass forward, we'll pass speed, but we'll pass the value of speed. And this value of speed, if we look up here, is 93. So in that way, you can kind of imagine speed being replaced with its value, speed being replaced with 93. So the motor is going to spin at 93 RPM. Now, for this particular function, does speed have to be spelled that way, or could I call it SP equals 93 and write SP where it says speed? Yes, okay. yes you can. The, there are some restrictions on uh, how, what you can name variables. I'm not, there, it depends on the language. I think in Python, as long as it doesn't start with like a number or some special character, you can, you can and as long as it doesn't have any spaces in it, you can name your variable whatever you want, really. Um, you can say, you can name it, this is the speed variable that I want or something like that. <laughs> and you can write that out a hundred, hundred times okay. and, and it will fine, yeah, it will be totally fine. Um, so yeah, that, that's yeah, that's a that's a really good question. All right, so so far we've just kind of shown where okay, I want this motor to spin, I want to take this value and I want to put in this variable. Well, sometimes we might get data from the robot sensors, or we might have some kind of calculation that we want to do, and depending on the results of that or the value of that, we might want to do something different. So um, we we can do this with what's called an if statement. So the if statement syntax is if I F, uh, and that's lowercase, that's, that's important, space, uh, and then the condition, so the thing that you're checking, a colon, and then underneath that we have a, we hit a tab to indent the code that's underneath that, and then we have the code. The indentation is very important. Uh, so you can see that here motor is indented from if, from if, and the other stuff is indented from else. And, oh, sorry, this E is supposed to be, uh, lowercase, it must have automatically uppercase. Sorry about that. So that E is supposed to be lowercase. Um, the indentation is extremely important in Python. Most languages don't care about the indentation. They have their own kind of like brackets to wrap the inside of an if statement. Python does not. It just has the colon and the uh, indentation is very important. So this is one of those things where Python's simple, but sometimes it's so simple that then you have to pay attention to things that you wouldn't otherwise pay attention to. So in this case, you have to make sure that you have that indentation. Vex code and most editors will automatically add that indentation when you write that if statement though, just to be helpful. So in this scenario here, we're gonna look at, um, uh, oh, so, that, so my, my uh, under, underscores are disappearing, that's weird. Uh, there's an underscore here between bumper and A, sorry about that. Uh, so we have a bumper called bumper A, um, bumper underscore A, and uh, we want to know if that bumper is pressed. So we call a function called bumper a dot pressing. Um, and the, what this uh, returns is if the bumper is pressed, so something's pressing and it's plugged in and, and pressed, then it will return true. If it is not pressed, it will return false. And if the condition inside the if statement returns true, then what is inside the if statement here in this little indentation will be executed. If it does not return true, if it returns false, 
then what is in the else statement will be executed. So we kind of have this branch in our uh, program execution here. So in this scenario, say we're trying to drive uh, forward until we hit a wall. And we have a bumper in the front of a robot. We don't want, you know, we want to hit the wall, but we don't want to like keep on running our motors as we're running into the wall and maybe overheat our motors, burn them up, whatever. So what we can do is we can check to see if the bumper's pressed, uh, and if it is, stop the motor. Uh, and if it isn't, then continue running the motor forward at 100%, at 100 RPM. Okay. Any questions on this here? This is this is a really important thing. We're gonna we're gonna expand on it a little bit here, but this is a very foundational thing. You can do many things with with if statements. All right. So. Uh, there's a little extension here to if statements. Um, if you want to check multiple things, um, one right after the other, uh, if, say, you want to check this, okay, if we didn't find that, then we'll check this thing, okay, then we didn't find that, then we'll check this thing. You can chain them together in what's called an elif, else if statement. It's kind of an abbreviation. Um, so in this scenario, say we have two bumpers, bumper A and bumper B. Um, if we want... Uh, Bumper, if bumper A is pressed, we can do the same thing as we did previously. The motor, the motor one can stop. Um, however, if bumper B is pressed, then uh, if bumper A is not pressed, sorry, if bumper A is not pressed, then we'll go on to check this next statement here. If bumper A is pressed, we won't check these other ones. These other ones will just be skipped. If bumper A is not pressed, then we'll check if bumper B is pressed, at which point, okay, we'll say we'll spin forward. But this can be replaced with whatever you want. Say maybe you want to move sideways if bumper B is pressed. Maybe you want to move slower. There's a lot of different options there. Um, and then again, same thing here. If neither of these two if statements came true, then we'll end up in the else statement at the end um, where we can execute to continue driving or something like that. Okay, any questions on this? So um, one thing that's kind of special about uh, robotics is that versus just normal programming programming is that we do a lot of things repeatedly. Uh, and if the way you can think about this is that say you're holding your controller and you want to press a button uh, and you want that button to do something on your robot. Well, your robot's going to have to be constantly checking to see if that button's pressed, right? If the button is pressed, then it wants to do something. But if it's not pressed, it's not going to do anything. But in order to respond when you press a button, it needs to be constantly checking to see if the button's pressed. So in this scenario here, um, we can kind of do uh, a second, we can do something similar to that. So say while we have bumper A uh, pressed, we can um, loop. So basically, this is going to continue executing these two lines of code, print and wait, um, while press bumper A is pressed. And we can see why. So this is what's called a while loop. A while loop will continually execute the code that's inside of it, in the order that it's inside of it, but it will continually loop around while the conditional at the top is true. And it will check it every single time it loops around. So if we're in an area where, where we're waiting for bumper A to stop being pressed, say, I don't know, a human's trying to just wait, make the robot wait for a little bit here. So it's just holding down the button. Um, we can repeatedly print a message to the console, which will show up on the computer or whatever you have that's plugged into the, into the brain, that says, pressed, with an exclamation point. And it will constantly say that. Every, and we have a wait here for what's 10 milliseconds or one hundredth of a second. So that means every 10 milliseconds, we'll get a print statement, and the, and the brain will check to see if the bumper is pressed. If it is no longer pressed, once it gets back up to here and check, it will not execute the loop anymore, and it will exit, and will continue on with the code that's below the loop. Okay. Everyone get that? All right. Okay, so now let's leave the slide deck for a little bit here, and let's look at Vexcode. So I have a couple versions of Xcode online here. Um, this is one of the nice things about Xcode. Xcode um, has the desktop app that you can download and will like run on your computer. 
there's a VexCode Pro, which kind of has a little bit more nice stuff for text. Um, and there's even a Visual Studio Code uh, extension for those of you who've used Visual Studio Code. Um, but the neat thing here about the, on, there's an online version that doesn't require any downloads. And if you have a brain that you plug into your computer, you can actually download code to that without downloading anything on your, on your computer, which is really nice. Um, alternatively, if you don't have a physical robot with you, if you're just at home or the robot's not done building yet or whatever, there is what's called Vex Code Virtual Skills. And the way you can, you can access this, every team that's registered uh, has a code on robot events. If you go to my teams on robot events, and uh, I, like, like you, go, you go to your homepage, you go to my teams, there will be a list of all your registered teams. And any team that's registered will have a um, VEX code virtual skills um, code. And it's like five or six characters long of just like random letters and numbers. And what that allows you to do is to go to VEX code uh, here, go to new virtual skills project, either blocks or text. And then you can enter that and enter your team number, and that will grant you access to that. And that actually is kind of a virtual competition where you can score as many points as, as possible. And let me, let me just boot up virtual skills here. So I, I've logged into 2114C's uh, environment here. And we can see there's actually a virtual model of the field here. And we can see here, let's see here, can I, hey, I can move it. So we can see that there's, there's a spin-up field right there. If you wanted to kind of explore the, the uh, spin up uh, game fields in kind of a virtual environment, this is a great place to do that. Um, let's see, can I expand this a little bit? Yay. Uh, so we have, it gives you a little pre built robot uh, that you can drive around um, and score with, and uh, a, a nice little physics environment here. Um, so it's just it's a great resource if you don't have access to a robot yet. Uh, or if you're still building it. Um, so in this in this scenario, we're going to look at some uh, Python code here. So I'm just going to hide that real quick. Can you um, yeah? Can you connect your remote control to that? That's a good question. Um, I'm actually not sure. I have not I've not had the chance to to try that. Um, I know that there was an older version of this called uh, Robot Virtual Worlds and Robot C. Um, and I remember I, I was able to control it with some like USB uh, Logitech controllers before. I don't know if you can control with, with sticks in this. Um, I think it's, it's mainly geared towards programming. But yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I'm not, I'm not sure the answer to that. Um, OK, so we can kind of look at some of the um, VEX code stuff here. So in, this, in, in uh, the skills, um, program here, they have a pre-configured what's called a drivetrain, which basically has all the motors and the drive are kind of grouped together, and all you have to do to make them all move in union is uh, call this dot drive program, or, or drive four. So in this scenario here, um, we're going to, I'm going to remove, I'm going to comment out this code. So that's actually another thing. If you don't want to delete a line of code, but you just kind of want, you want it to not function but you still kind of want to leave it there, you can put a hashtag at the beginning of it, and it will just be treated as a comment. The computer will ignore it, but it's still there if you want to undo it. So in this scenario here, if we go ahead and run the program, um, we'll see that the robot drives forward 200 millimeters. Uh, we can change this. Uh, let's see here. Stop. And no. oh, yeah, you can, you know, there's like a global leaderboard you can submit your score to. But we're not going to do that yet. So uh, if I increase this, say, to, let's say, 600 millimeters. Let's just drive real far here. Uh, and then I hit play. We're going to see if the robot goes further. Uh, we can then um, stack. We can, we can add some more commands here. So uh, and you mentioned wanting to see a list of commands. Here on the left, this is your list of commands. There are different categories. So say for motion is going to give you your motors to spin and stuff like that. There's going to be drivetrain which gives you all of your drivetrain different functions. Um, they call it looks, but it's basically just some text that you, you might want to print to the screen or something like that. Um, events, that's a little bit of a complicated thing. Control, so that, those are that if statements, the if else statements, the while loop that we saw. Um, and there's a different kind of loop called a for loop. Uh, we see some sensor functions here. So if we want to get the um, heading 
function? Oh, sorry. Just, just a question. How does it know it went 600 millimeters? Right. Do you have to define the variables for like wheel size, or does you have a sensor that's providing that feedback? So that's a good question. So in the virtual skills, they kind of have a drivetrain that had to pre. It's in their virtual environment that pre has like the the wheel diameter and the gear ratio and all that configured. However, if we look at the normal VEX code here, um, we're going to see we don't actually have a drivetrain class yet. However, if we go to our devices, we can set up a uh, drivetrain actually, uh, either two motors or four motors, and we can go through this whole little wizard here. So let's say we have a, a left motors in the in the one port, a right motors in the two ports. We can choose whether we want it to use the inertial sensor or GPS or three wire or, or that gyro sensor, the old one. Um, so let's just choose inertial, we'll say that that's in port three. We can tell it uh, our wheel diameter. So VEX, they have a lot of their pre-configured wheel di diameter set up for us here. So four inches is about, is about a normal one. And let's say we have a one to three gear ratio. We can also then configure what the gear cartridges are in our motors. So this is all kind of like a, a nice conclu conclusive thing here. And then here we are, all, all, we have all these uh, drivetrain functions that we can use here on the left hand side. And the neat thing about having these all on the left is that you can actually hold down click and you can drag them into your code. So you don't have to manually type them out. If you want, if you find a command you want to use, you can just drag it over and then tune it however you want. So that drive forward command here, that's how we can get that in the real world robot program. Okay, so um, same, same thing here. So let's say we want to turn the robot to the left. Uh, let's see here, drivetrain. That turn four, all right, here we go. This looks about right what we want here. And note the indentation here. In the uh, virtual uh, robot, you have to make sure you put your code in what's called main here, the main function. Uh, if you put it down here, uh, it's going to execute uh, not how you want it to. So you want to make sure that it's in this, you got this uh, uh, tab here uh, to denote that it's inside the main function. In the normal code, you can kind of just write code at the base level of the file. So we're gonna turn to the right 90 degrees. Let's make that left, actually. And let's make it, say, 45 degrees, because say we wanna turn and kind of start driving across the field. Uh, let's take that, and then let's take uh, this drive four here. And let's say we wanna drive four uh, another 12, but let's make it inches this time. All right, and now we can go ahead and run our code. So the code, so we drove for, um, we turned left, went 40, left 45 degrees, and we went forward for another 12 inches. We can increase that. Let's make it, uh, say, 48 inches. So we're going to reset here. So the the, the nice thing is that the um, the functions are a little kind of. They're, at least most of the time they're named in a way that's kind of self-descriptive what, of what they're doing. Um, and that's kind of just a, a good practice when you're naming functions, you wanna name them in a way that describes what they do. So, yeah, um, let's see here. Oh, and another thing is that if you wanna know more about how a function works, there's this little question mark here on the left-hand side, that you, on the right-hand side that you can hit click. And that'll bring up this really helpful um, help article on the right-hand side that um, gives you some kind of uh, example uses for that function, uh, tells you what kind of uh, units you might be able to use, um, and also gives you kind of, so there, there might be some hidden uh, parameters here. So say we wanted to kind of move two motors at once a certain distance. Well, you can turn on, there's this hidden function here that you can, sorry, this hidden parameter that you can use at the end here called weight. Um, and so for instance, let's, let's enable that here. So what we're gonna say here, what we're saying is that we're going to make it so that the computer does not wait until the robot has actually driven 600 millimeters before moving on to the next function here. So let's see what happens when we do that. Let's see, wait equals false. And you can see that it actually gave me a little suggestion for what to type there, and I just hit enter, and it automatically completed it. Vex code is very nice in that, in that way. So let's retry here. Set. All right, so now we're not waiting until it goes all the way forward, but let's see what happens. So we can see that it, it started moving forward, but immediately after that, because it didn't wait for the moving forward to finish, it just started it and then immediately moved on to the next command. The next command tells the robot to turn. So before it even really gets going 
moving forward, it's going to immediately start and try, try and start uh, turning to the left 45 degrees. So in this way, we kind of skipped the uh, drive forward command. And this is something you kind of want to keep in mind that if you're seeing your commands to the drivetrain be skipped, then um, this could be a, way, a reason for that. How much time do we have? Okay. All right. Any questions so far on this? Let me ask one other question because I kind of missed it. But once is when you're explaining about the the, the code because I was looking it up. Then you opened up the screen. Where did you open up that screen at to get to the to your virtual? Get to this here. Okay, so um, there is a couple different. Uh, Okay, so get to the virtual, like this entire. Yeah, page. like the like your where you're practicing and everything. Cause yep. I, I just started seeing all your all the codes and the Python or your Vex code and all that. Yeah. So I so if you if you go ahead and like search on Google Vex code uh, online, you can see uh, Vex code overview here. Oh, where I saw the link here. That'd be fine. And then see, there's a, there's a link called codev5.vex.com. Okay. Uh, that will give you the uh, VEX code that you can use to program a real robot or that you can use for skills. Okay. Uh, and that's a little link here. And that gives me here. So now that dumps me into kind of the uh, place for programming a real robot. If I want to program the skills robot, then uh, we can go up to file here and choose new virtual skills text project. And that gives us that, which is with our uh, uh, virtual bit of the field here. Would there be a, what's the reason for using the app over the website? Um, the app came first. Um, the, the website was the thing that they developed afterwards. Um, I think that the app, the website probably works best with Chrome because it's because it's trying to communicate through a website with something that's actually plugged into your computer. That can be an issue that some web browsers might not support that super well. Um, and I think Chrome is probably the best, uh, but sometimes there can be some issues with that. So sometimes it's beneficial to have a piece of software that's actually running on your computer uh, natively for that. All right. Uh, oh yeah, and we, so we can also take a look at, go back to all of X code here. I think, oh yeah, and that's another thing. You can also import. Uh, so, I, so for instance, when it saved, it downloaded this file here, VexCode Pro uh, Project, sorry, VexCode Project V5 Python. I can, you can load those files. Uh, and we can see that our code is loaded up right here. So in this, I kind of have some of those. Um, this is actually kind of where I was writing some of the code for the slides that we saw before. Uh, here's the if statement. Um, we hit enter. We can see that we're kind of inside of it. Um, you can see the stop, the spin, uh, the while. Uh, one thing that's, that you'll see a lot of uh, in robot code is if you have a while statement and then true. And what this means was that, is that, well, true will always be true. There is no scenario in which true will not be true unless like the universe is ending or something like that. Uh, so this means that this will always will loop forever. Basically, there is no scenario in which this loop will stop looping, and that's very useful when you want to say uh, drive your robot for the entire match. Uh, you don't want your robot just to be drivable while a bumper is pressed or something like that. You want the loop to continue going forever until the program just ex uh, uh, is forcibly ended by you know stopping it on your controller or whatever. So you'll put something in here, uh, like checking for bumper states, checking for button press states. So in this scenario here, let's say if, uh, and then we'll search for, we've got a controller, right? So let's see here. What are the controller? Oh, I think we can probably actually set up the controller. Yep, controller one. Cool, so we have controller one. If we go to controller one, Sensing, yes. Controller dot, yeah, okay, so that, so that will, we can say we, if we if we have a controller uh, and the top, and we're pressing 
up. So like say there's a, there's on the controller there's arrows on the right hand side and letters on the left hand side, or is it uh, other way around? If you're pressing the up arrow, then this will evaluate to true. So in this scenario, we can write if statement that says if controller one button up is pressing, then we can do motor one dot spin. Uh, we can we can just copy this line here. Make sure, make sure that we have that tab. If it was out of here, then this it would not be uh, based on this if statement. It would just always execute. We want to make sure it's inside the if statement. So if it's if we're pressing the up button, then the motor is going to spin forward at 100 RPM. And else means if that's not true. So let's move the else to be aligned down here with the if. If it's not being pressed, then we can do motor one dot stop. This is a really simple way of using driver control with your um, joystick. If you're pressing the button, the motor spins. If you let go of the button, the motor doesn't spin anymore. If I don't tap that, the motor's gonna keep on spinning. Sorry? What? If I don't tab motor one spin, it will start spinning, right? Correct, exactly. So in this in this scenario here, it might give you a little bit of an error, because it's like, okay, the, it's gonna wonder where how the heck the else is, is there. Yeah. But, Ignoring this here, yes, it's going to say if, okay, and then there's nothing inside the if statement, uh -huh. so it's going to do nothing. Or say, you know, we just have something that does nothing. Pass is basically a do nothing command. Uh -huh. um, then, yes, the motor is going to always spin. Every single time this loops through, it's going to tell, motor, you spin. It's not going to depend on the outcome of the if statement. So to, be, the, to depend on the outcome of the if statement, it has to be inside the if statement, which we'd use by tabbing it over. All right, I think we're about done with the VEX code side of things here. I'm going to go back to some version control stuff. Any questions before we do that? All right, okay. Zoom this section. I've got another. How much do I have? All right, so part two. Version control. Drink so, um, one question that we have um, a lot is if you have multiple computers, multiple students, little people working on code, or maybe you just want to work across your code at home as well as at school, or maybe you just want to back up with your code so that in the scenario you lose your code, you lose your thumb drive, whatever, something terrible happens, you have a backup. Uh, a lot of people will use flash drives, maybe Google Drive or Dropbox or OneDrive to put to save their code, um, or even they'll just kind of save it to their desktop and hope for the best. Um, I wouldn't recommend that. I've seen uh, unfortunate circumstances where people forgot to bring the laptop to the competition or forgot the USB stick or lost it or accidentally deleted the code. Um, in that scenario, there's even if you have the code on the robot, it is, it is when it's on the robot, it is machine code. And there's no real way to kind of translate that back into a human readable code. Uh, so once it's on the robot, it's you can't really get it back off that. So you've got to keep that, that copy of the code on your computer. Um, so I recommend keeping backups. So, um, but however, if you use Google Drive or Dropbox and you have multiple computers doing that, they might end up with conflicts and multiple different copies of it, and it's just kind of a disaster. So there's a better option for this. It's called Git. Git is what's called a version control software, and it keeps track of the changes to your code. Um, and if you have, say, a change, you made a change to the file, and then someone else at the same time made a change to the file, and you both push your changes, then it will kind of help deal with the multiple changes, and if they're at, to different parts of the file, it'll be able to merge them seamlessly without you having to do anything. And if they're to the same part of the file, it'll kind of guide you through picking which changes you want to keep. And that's an area it's very, very useful. Um, another thing that Git allows you to do is what's called make a branch. A branch is kind of, say you, you, you're writing a, a, you're autonomous, right? And you want to add, you want to change the autonomous so that it goes and gets another two disks before shooting into the goal. However, your competition is coming up, 
and you don't and you know that your current autonomous works, you just want to score a few more points. So you want to be able to make some changes to the autonomous without affecting while still having that opportunity to use the, the uh, reliable but lower scoring autonomous. So in this scenario, what you can do is you can make what's called a branch, and all of your changes to the, to the files, once you're on that branch, will stay on that branch only. So in this scenario here, we have, we have the master branch here, which is continuing through the center here. You can branch off here, make your autonomous changes. And then before the competition, you can, or even after the competition, you can then merge your changes back into master. So that means that now all your changes that you're making here are now present in the main branch. But at the same time, someone else could have branched off before you made those merges, and then they'll merge afterwards. And if, there, if they made any conflicts, then they'll have to deal with that, but the software will help them go through that. If there weren't any conflicts, it'll just merge and do it all automatically for you. So in this way, you can have multiple people, say one person wants to work on the lift controls, one person wants to work on the autonomous. They can have separate branches, and then when they're ready, when they're done with each, they can merge back into the master or main branch without um, having to copy around files or copy and paste code and all that stuff. GitHub, which you may have heard of before, is a remote website for Git projects. Um, and Git projects are called repositories. That's just kind of the term that we're used for them. And the way that, the neat, neat thing about it is that it acts as a remote offsite, you know, in the internet, in the cloud, backup of your code. Um, this allows multiple people to have um, a Git project or Git repo uh, on their computers. And then they can kind of push their code and pull the code from GitHub itself. It's, the, it's kind of the central server. And that way they, you can have multiple people pushing and pulling to that and uh, collaborating on code. So when you make a change, uh, you can push that change to GitHub, and then the other person can pull that change. And until they pull that change, it doesn't, it doesn't come to their computer. But when they pull it, it they, they'll get your changes. Okay. Uh, all right, so I'm going to end this, the slides again. So I have uh, a piece of software called GitHub Desktop. GitHub Desktop is... Uh, software made by GitHub that will kind of give you nice buttons to press for interacting with Git. Um, Git is a program that you can interact with through the, the command line and enter in commands. Um, I don't find that super intuitive a lot of the time, uh, so I recommend people use a, a Git GUI um, like a, with buttons and stuff like this. So in this scenario here, I have a folder uh, called, oh, let's see here, I think it's in documents called Intro to Programming here, and it is a uh, code project. This is technically for a uh, coding library called Prose, but same difference here. So say let's look at my code here. Uh, let's open it in Visual Studio Code here. So now this is C++, this is not Python, so it's, it's gonna look a little bit different, but a lot of the concepts are still here. So let's just write, uh, make a change to this thing here. Let's say I want to add another comment, and in C++ comments are used, are done, are uh, noted by two slashes rather than a hashtag. So let's say this is a comment. So I'll write that. I'm going to do Control S to save that file. Now, when we look in Git, we'll see that it found that we made a change to that file. As soon as we save that file, it will track that change. So now I can say, let's say I want to commit my change to the main branch. I can write a nice little message saying what I changed. So let's see here. You can say added a comment uh, in the main loop. And we can, I can give an even more detailed description here. Um, or I can just go ahead and, and commit. So this is ready to go. So let's commit this. Now I've committed this to main. Now it's going to say, oh, you have one thing to push. So now I've made a change, but that's not yet. I haven't yet uploaded that to the internet. That's still just on my computer. Um, if I want to push that change to GitHub, I can either press this button here or I can press the little upload push origin button here. So if I'm going to go ahead. Uh, actually, before I do that, let me go to, I have GitHub pulled up here. And you just happen to be using Python. It could be any code. Yes. Here. Uh oh. Hopefully it doesn't let me out. There we go. Uh, right, 
here's my repo. So we can see here, if we go to the uh, version of the code that exists in the internet here on GitHub, we can see, if we scroll down, we can see that my comment isn't there yet. But now, if I go ahead and push that change, it'll take a second here, it'll refresh. Now we'll see that we don't have any local changes. No local changes, that means that we're exact, we have the same, uh, the code that's on our computer is the same as that's in the cloud. And now if I go ahead and refresh this page, there's our change, it popped up right there. And now any person uh, on our team is, is free to clone or pull this code down to their laptops. Now they can have my changes, um, just simply. So I think we can actually make a, we can, let's say, let's, let's edit the file on GitHub here. We can do this here. Let's say this is, oh, two slashes, this is another comment. Say we added another comment from GitHub website. All right, so we can do that. All right, so now we can see in, in the version on the website, we have another comment. Now, in the code here, we can still see that we still only have the original comment. So what we need to do is go to GitHub desktop. We can do what's a fetch, which is basically kind of just a check to see if anything's changed that we might need to download. We're gonna click fetch. Wait a second. We're gonna see, it's gonna say that there is one change, one commit uh, that's on GitHub that we can download. So let's go ahead and download that. All right. And now if we go ahead and go back to our file, we can see that we just got that change. And another neat thing that you can do, and this is something that um, I've seen people do for notebooks. I've seen, um, yeah, a lot of notebooks and just also team organization is that you can kind of print out your git commit history or your git branch history. Um, you, there's ways of, if we look back at the, uh, let's see here, if we look back at this graph right here, um, there are actually ways of generating graphs that kind of look like this of your, of what your actual changes were over time. And uh, it's actually really like a really cool idea to print that out and put it in your notebook uh, for the judges to see. Uh, but yeah, so this is also, if you make a change and you wanted to see who made that change or maybe why it was made or when it was made or even revert back to that, that original uh, working code, you can scroll through this history here and see um, what every change that has ever been made to the code. Uh, which, you know, say you actually deleted the code. Well, that's just a change. You can pull up the code and say, well, here's where we deleted all the code, but before that, here's where all the code still was. Um, so in this scenario, let's see here, can we, uh, yeah, so, uh, revert change. Oh, there's some conflicts. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff in Git. Um, Git is a very big uh, program. I don't normally use uh, GitHub desktop, so there, I don't remember all the, how to do everything in it, but um, Git is a very big program. You can do some pretty crazy things with it. Um, it is useful for anything that you're, any kind of code that you're gonna be collaborating with, and even if you're just working on, on, your, on yourself. Um, I know that when I uh, got to college, uh, in the first semester that I did, we had a collaborative programming assignment where we had to program a robot, actually, a little Lego robot to, to navigate a maze using a programming language none of us have ever worked with before. Um, so one thing that I did, the first thing I did was I got uh, my teammates up to speed on Git, so that way every single person in the team could collaborate. And instead of what happens a lot of the time where one person does 90% of the programming and then only that person kind of gets the benefit of learning from that programming, uh, we were all able to collaborate and every single person on the team was able to write code and interface and collaborate on that. So every person got the benefit of learning. Um, and that definitely applies to VEX as well. So if you want more people to learn on your team to learn programming, if you want you know, maybe the more senior students to be able to teach the younger students, uh, then having Git, having that ability to collaborate um, easily without conflicts, without stepping on each other's toes is a big thing. Um, Git is a great tool for that. As an educator, can I see who's not pulling their weight? Absolutely. So um, that is, that is a huge thing. Uh, in college, 
last semester, for instance, since I'm, I'm now getting up to upper, uh, more advanced classes, we have big semester-long software projects that we have to work on with teams. And one of the things that the instructor does at the end of every deliverable cycle is that she will go back in the Git history and see who's making changes, who's making who's making meaningful changes. So if someone just made a bunch of you know a hundred commits, it's just like I added this comment here. Then they're like, okay, you know, that's that's not cool. Um, but if they're if they're making big features, adding adding a lot of value to the software, this is the primary way that they will gauge that through. So understanding how to use Git is super valuable for VEX, it's super valuable for any kind of programming you're gonna do in high school, and it's super valuable for anything, any kind of programming you're gonna do in college and beyond. Um, I would say it is probably the number one tool besides, actually besides the programming language itself, Git is like the, ne the next thing you I, I use. Basically every time I use it, I start a new project, I'll put it in Git just to be able to revert back to things and see what I've done. So, yeah, uh, any questions on Git so far? So with Git, when you, uh, when you, if you don't have an account on Git and you try to establish one, that's where you set up for your, your, your own folder and then your own password, and then that's what you give to your regular teammates? No, so every single person that, um, uh, so, so I'll repeat for the microphone. The question was, uh, if you have a uh, account on GitHub, uh, do teammates share that account or do they create their own account? And the answer is that they create their own accounts. Um, the reason for that is that in here we can see who made each change, and in order to see who made each change, you need to have a different account for each person. Now, the main thing is that GitHub accounts are free, um, and you can even get GitHub Pro for free I, I know you can do it if you, you can get GitHub Pro for free if, if you're a college student. I think you can also get it if you're a high school student. I'd have to double check. Uh, but you can make your projects private, so you don't, it doesn't have to be a public project. Uh, if you just want to keep your codes, your team's code private, that's totally fine. Um, you can do that. Um, and then the way that it would typically work is every single person would create their own GitHub account, and then you'll give them access in the GitHub uh, repo thing. So if I go to, say, here, settings, I believe, we can go to collaborators. Uh, let's just hit. We can add people. And I can search, you can either send them an email, you can get their username or even their full name, and then it will just give, you can choose whether they can just view the repository, whether they can edit it, or whether they're like an administrator. So. If, if, as a mentor, what you could do is you could make yourself the administrator and then just give them push and pull permissions, but then you can kind of set permissions maybe, um, you know, so they can't overwrite the history or something like that. Uh, there, there's, there's a lot of uh, permissions and usefulness in that way. Any, any other questions on Git? All right. Uh, well, we got... 15 minutes or so. All right. Uh, well, that's more or less the end of the scripted portion, but let's see here. There's, there's a couple more things. So um, here's, a, here's a, uh, an idea, a project idea. Uh, if your team's still kind of building a robot, you don't have a robot to drive around and program yet. Um, one thing that's, that's super useful this year is that your robot can start on two different sides of the field that are not symmetrical to each other. So depending on where your robot starts, your autonomous is probably going to need to do different things. Uh, and if you have multiple alternate autonomouses, you can have an advantage and you can synergize with your uh, partner much better, potentially. So uh, there's a couple ways that you can have multiple autonomouses in one program. First, you can make actually uh, buttons on the on the brain screen that you can kind of choose to like a little menu saying, all right, are you on the blue or red side? Okay, are you on the uh, roller side or the uh, other side of the goal? Uh, what tile are you staring in? And then you can have like different variants. So I know that like uh, top teams at Worlds will often have like five or six different variants of their autonomous, uh, especially when it comes to trying to counter autonomouses from their opponents, because maybe their opponents will go for the rollers or whatever. This year, because the, there's no neutral zone, it's just kind of that line, 
It's not quite as necessary, uh, but last year a lot of it was kind of, there was a lot of count strategies and counter strategies along around which autonomous you were going to choose to go to which goal in the center of the, of the field at the beginning of the match. So there's a lot of strategy from that. Alternatively, if you want a little bit simpler idea, um, you can take a potentiometer, uh, and this is something I did almost all of my years of high school because it was just super simple and I really liked it. Uh, what you can do is you can take a potentiometer and you can kind of make like a little gauge with this little gear here or you can just ha attach a screw to it and just spin it and mark it out on and marker on the potentiometer. And say if the potentiometer is spin, sp uh, spun to the left here, you're starting with autonomous one. If it's spun to the right, you're spinning with autonomous two. And in your code, you can say, before you run the autonomous, you can be like, if potentiometer is greater than this value, run this auton. And if it's less than this value, run the other autonomous. Uh, and in that way, you can kind of switch which autonomous you're doing, but without downloading your code, without anything of that. So like, you can basically just put your robot down in the field and be, look at your opponents, strategize a little bit, and then change the autonomous right there. Oh, that is awesome. Yeah. So that's super useful. And I know like in, in the zone uh, with the cones, uh, a lot, sometimes people would have autonomous, as this is before we had the autonomous line, sometimes people would have autonomous that would drive across the field. So one strategy that people did was they would point their robot like they were going to go in one direction, and then they would change their autonomous so the robot would actually turn and go the other the other way, <laughs> and the robot would miss that was, was trying to hit them. So there's strategies uh, involved in that. But, uh, yeah, so um, I think we can just... I wanted to kind of just show a brief overview of the other main text programming language uh, that uh, is used in VEX. Um, it's called uh, C++. It's a little bit more complicated, uh, but you might see some of the similar uh, concepts here. So let me pull, go back to... So this is this is actually code that I've uh, written for our Vexu robots here. So if I go to the off control here, uh, this one we can kind of see uh, some similar things here. So we're going to get the an analog value, which is like a stick on uh, on the controller, and we're going to say the left stick uh, and the Y value. Oh, sorry. Oh, like, oh, make it yeah, bigger. that's actually a good point. Uh, Thank you for reminding me of that. Gosh, I thought it was usually control. control. I did control. Thank you. It usually works with scroll. There we go. Sorry about that. Is that good? Thank you. Um, yeah, so we can get we can get an analog stick. So you, there's, there's some similarities here. We're still using parentheses. Uh, we're still using dots, and we're still having, you know, there's this is not super unlike something you might see in Python. Now the colons here are a little weird. That's kind of a Python, that's right, that's kind of a, a C++ thing. Um, but this is, this is pretty similar here. So we're taking this value and we're then gonna divide it by 127, the slash is, a, is the divide symbol uh, in both Python and C++. Uh, so this is just kind of a, a taste of that once you learn, once you learn one programming language and the concepts behind that programming language, that is the most important thing to learn. Because once you learn those concepts, those concepts are actually applicable across a very wide pro wide variety of programming languages. Even though C++ might have a little bit of different syntax and has some different bells and whistles on it, underneath the, the same logic of here's a while true loop, and uh, there's if statements, they're all, they're, you know, like, so for instance, if statement, uh, oh, I can't edit this. Uh, say an if statement, uh, looks like this. Uh, in C++, it, they replace the uh, necessity of uh, indentation with brackets. So for instance here, if this code is actually here, it'll still work. If inside the if statement because we have it wrapped around these brackets. Uh, that's one of the nice things about C++. Um, here. And the same thing for like an else statement here. 
Uh, but the point being that it, it's more about if you understand the concept of an if statement. Uh, and then once you understand that, you can just say if statement C++ in Google, and it'll tell you how to do it. And once you understand that concept, the syntax of where to put those brackets, where to put those spaces, is just kind of that last 10%. The 90% of programming is understanding the concepts behind it and trying to solve those problems. So I just want to just kind of show that we did some, some Python stuff, but it's not actually, once you know Python, it's actually not that hard to make the move to something like C++. All right. So it's a, it's a fast by my curiosity. What is this doing? Is it putting it into tank mode? Or yeah. What? Okay. Uh, so, so it's, <laughs> tank mode is a, um, it's kind of a, a a colloquial way to uh, refer to if you have the left stick of your controller, yeah. that pushing that up and down controls the left side of the drive of the robot, okay. and then pushing the right stick up and down controls the right side of the drive. Okay. So if you push both sticks forward, yeah. the robot goes forward. If you push them both back, it goes back. If you push them in opposite directions, it'll just turn on the spot. Okay, cool, thank you. Yeah. That, that's called tank control. So yeah. you can see we're getting the value of the left stick, yep. and we're getting the value of the right stick. Yep. And that's where we're giving to the tank. Okay, cool, thank you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> All right, so I think we're at the end of the main presentation here. Is there any questions about anything that we've covered? So, so as, a, as, a, as a new coach, where would you kind of direct your students to kind of work primarily in the, in the one environment or is there a preference or is there a difference? Does it matter? Um, at the beginning of the season, uh, if they're new to text programming, I would recommend that they start in Vexcode like this. Um, the downside of this Vexcode is it's a little simplistic. So for instance, you can't have multiple files uh, with your code in it. So as we can see here in, uh, scroll up here, that uh, my code is, is generally broken up into a bunch of different files, which I think really helps with organization. And that really helps once you get to more advanced, fully featured programs. Uh, but for your average VEX program, especially at the beginning of the season, you don't really need multiple files. Um, but yeah, so VEX code is, is a good start. Uh, the new, but if they want something more uh, than this kind of this kind of integrated environment here that's, that has a little bit of the bells and whistles removed to make things simple. Uh, if they want to move on beyond that, there is the Visual Studio Code extension. And Visual Studio Code is actually this editor that I've been using right here. Yeah. Um, there is an extension here. Actually, I bet you I can search for it right now. Um, ah, oh, I saw it right there. Right there, Vex Robotics. You can install this extension, and you can write Python. You can write C++ for Vex Robots right here in Visual Studio Code. You can have multiple different files. Um, it actually works better with Git uh, than, the, than the, the web browser one, the web browser one. We'll work with Git, it's just not quite as integrated. Um, but yeah, so that, this is a great option if, if people want to move, if kids want to move on from uh, uh, the browser-based or the, the normal VEX code. Um, yeah, that's a great option. If, and if they really want to get advanced, um, there is a, um, another programming environment called Pros, uh, and that's made, that's actually kind of made from, by some college students out of uh, Purdue uh, University, actually, and it, it's what I personally use, um, and that allows you to use any editor that you want, so if you use, like, if anyone's here has heard of IntelliJ or C-Lion or something like that, uh, more industry standard editors, although Visual Studio Code is a pretty industry standard editor. Mm -hmm. um, you can use, you can write in your code anywhere you want like that, and it, it allows a little bit more command line flexibility and stuff like that. But that's more advanced stuff, um, yeah. but personally, I, I, I prefer that side. But for new students, VexCode is, is a very good option. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. I think we're done. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.